So my name is Tim Jeffries, Mick has just arrived, just there, um, and I've only just come to Thailand, I'm new to the kind of international circuit. Um, if I speak too fast, as some of you have been worried that I might, uh, Fred has agreed to, to translate, so please just put your hand up at any stage during the presentation and say, what on earth have you just said? And Fred will endeavour to translate. That's right, isn't it, Fred? Yeah. yeah. If I can do it, then maybe we get back on us. So, uh, <laughs> now, before you yeah. continue, Tim, because I yeah. was just yeah. late by someone, unfortunately, because I need to introduce this gentleman to you. Let's do this properly. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, thank you very much for your attendance. Many familiar faces here. In fact, I'm looking around this room, there's a lot of the um, very supportive parents who time and time again get involved in the school, educate themselves alongside their, their children in this room. So there's parents in this room you'll get to know very well. Um, as the school has developed over the last few years, I've very much um, held off um, expanding my leadership team. Um, I'm a headmaster. Headmasters have styles, just like you in your professional lives and family lives have styles. My style is, is to really be involved in my school. I like children, I like parents, I like the school as a community. That's actually um, one of the key aspects of my job I enjoy. So I have held off expanding my leadership team until this year. Uh, we've covered uh, an awful lot of ground in the last few years. We've focused very, very carefully on improving uh, the curriculum experience of your children, lower school and upper school, very much getting the base right, making sure that the basic skills are as they should be in terms of children learning, uh, speaking, listening, reading, writing skills, mathematics, digital citizenship, and then now growing through into the upper school and a much stronger focus through the seven faculty structure on standards in secondary education prep, SR5, as well as A levels, culminating in really strong A level results and very strong university guidance and counselling. What we've also been doing is lots of other things behind the scenes. We've been doing a lot of work on campus, a lot of work on H build a lot of work on streamlining other systems as well. And we finally got to the point where I accepted that I needed more capacity, and you're looking at it, bandwidth expansion. Um, so he'll be very modest, he was about to launch straight into his talk, but Tim Jeffries, um, Dr. Tim Jeffries, um, arrived um, coming through a very, very tough recruitment process that you won't have mentioned. Um, I, I visited um, four very, very strong candidates for this post of second master, a post that the school had never had before. Um, Tim was always strong going through the process and got stronger and stronger for a range of reasons. Um, number one, his uh, educational experience is absolutely outstanding, very, very relevant for what we're looking for here in the school. He, he's a teacher through and through. Um, however, he's also very strong on administrative, management, leadership um, attributes. Um, he's um, uh, a teacher, he's also completely absorbed with boarding. Um, so coming from very strong schools, offering boarding, Warwick School, Uppingham School, and Oswestry School, where he was uh, deputy head in charge of curriculum. Not a coincidence, but not a key factor for us. He's also an old Herodian. He attended Harrow School. His favourite teacher was his geography teacher, who was Mel, our head, headmaster over in Hong Kong until he retired this, this summer. So if you chop his leg off, it says Harrow through the middle. It's amazing. It's fantastic. Um, an absolute clincher for us, though, um, as we expand our, our provision, as we seek to improve our provision, was his skill with systems. So we believe now that we've got a very strong curriculum, but what we are looking at now is, is the whole campus and its management needs, from boarding to afternoon provision to uh, safeguarding and the safety of your children. His job description, three pages, doesn't it? Yeah, I think it's still three pages. <laughs> All sorts of issues, educational, operational, health and safety. And crucially, he's going to be good at it, not just because he's got the experience he's got, not just because he's handsome and smiley and has a very quick brain, but because also he's a, he's a, a user of technology. He's a very techie guy. 
uh, and that's actually the focus of the first talk he wanted to give you. So that was a slightly too long introduction as to how he arrived here this morning. So now, Dr. Tim Jeffries, I hand over Thank to you. Apologies again. I think we can finish there. <laughs> My wife would be chuckling at me being described as bandwidth. I think that's <laughs> lovely. Um, so, uh, I've called this talk um, Technology and the Teenage Brain, and um, this is what I'm going to try and cover today uh, in 20 minutes. I might go slightly over 20 minutes, uh, and I will definitely be taking questions at the end because I, I think it will raise some questions. So, I'm going to go uh, give a quick romp about what we know about the brain. Uh, I'm going to look at the effects of technology, both positive and negative, how we mitigate them and how we harness them, and then I'm going to move on to questions. I'm going to start with a little practical exercise, and Mr. Farley is going to have to come back down. So, and Fred, you need to be ready as well. Um, this is uh, an interesting area of brain science. I, I don't know whether any of you have. Have any of you read this book, Peak Secrets from the New Science of Expertise? It's brilliant, and you must put it on your reading list. It's absolutely fantastic. One of the things it talks about is, is memory. And um, there's a world championships in memory. One of the tasks is remembering digits delivered at one-second intervals. Mr. Farley, yes. please leave the room with Fred. Oh, no. There you go. <laughs> Off you go. So we'll just leave them to it. Um, so the, the task is digits remembered at one second intervals, and we're going to have a go. The world record look for this is 456 digits, read out, not shown to you on a bit of paper, at one second intervals. Who reckons they can get to 456? Right, we're going to try 25, okay? Phones away, no bits of paper, ready? Okay, get in the zone, here we go, these are the digits. One, one, eight, one, five, one, nine, five, three, one, eight, zero, five, one, zero. Six, six, two, zero, one, two, one, nine, one, four. Just leave a little time for that to sink in. <laughs> Who's got it? Who's got it? Anyone got it? More importantly, who reckons Mr. Farley can get it? Yeah, it would be really interesting. So remember, the world record is 456 digits, read out at that speed, one per second. And we're going to see, just give him a couple more seconds, whether Mr. Farley can get anywhere near 25 digits. Just have another show of hands. Who thinks he can get near 25 digits? Okay, so we're all agreed. One person. You're putting your money where your mouth is there. So, so one person thinks he can get near 25 digits, okay? One person. Let's have a look. Can we get him back in? Which door did he go out of? This one. Okay, so I'll walk slowly to give him a bit of time. Just build up the atmosphere. Is he ready, Fred? He's got to come in. Go as far as he can. Okay, so here he is. Here he is. Mr. Farley is going to have a go face the audience at reciting a 25 digit number. So, 118. Sorry, look that way, Nick, and then we'll put this out. Yep. So 118, 15, 1953. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. No, you're dead on. We're still pretty impressed, even if that's as far as you can get, but just see if you can dig it out. See if you can dig it out. I think what came next is 1805. Then uh, we go to 1066, famous 
gobsmacked. Only one person thought you could do that. <laughs> Only one person thought you could do that. That is Anyone just in <laughs> <laughs> that is just incredible. So um, how did he do that? Well, we cheated a little bit. I gave him a sheet and this just shows you how incredible the mind is. And it had some pictures on it. Seven pictures because seven's about the maximum that you can put in your working memory. Mick knew all the numbers beforehand. I hadn't briefed you, had I? No. Did you know that was going to happen? No. Not at all. So it came straight out of the blue. Seven pictures. The first picture, and it's significant, by the way, that he is English. This might not work so well with Thai people, because these things might not mean the same to you. 118, for English people, means... It's a telephone. Directory inquiries. Okay, you see, all English people know this. Yeah? British. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 15, 15. Mick, what was the clue for 15? Um, rugby. Or rugby. So rugby, that's the number of teams, uh, number of players in a rugby uh, team. And 1953 for British people is significant because that was the coronation of our Queen Elizabeth. 1805 is the Battle of Trafalgar. Significant for British people, a good trouncing of the Europeans. 1066 was the last time we got trounced by the Europeans. Uh, 2012 is the London Olympics. And 1914, you probably will know, is the start of World War I. So you can see that if you're English or British, you kind of know those figures already. So you don't need to remember anything. All you need to do is remember the order. Once you know what you're remembering, in under a minute, I reckon that was, Fred, don't you? He got it, OK? Similar techniques are used, believe it or not, for getting up to 456. And I use that illustration just because I want to start this presentation by telling you all the human brain is unbelievable. Yeah? It has huge untapped depths, not least the teenage brain, but it really does. We can get a headmaster in his 50s in under a minute to remember a 25-digit number just like that. Yeah, and I have it's a incredible. Lot of other yeah. on my mind. And he has a lot of other things on his mind. Yeah. <laughs> so, does this look familiar? The teenage brain. We've got a lot of year nine parents in here, and for some of you, this will be kind of ringing bells. Um, what do we know about the brain? We actually know not very much. Um, we've had EEG scans since the 1920s, we've had MRI scans since the 1970s. But only in the last 15 years or so, we've had fMRI. And they're significant because they allow us to map what's going on with the blood in the brain. Um, and you may or may not know that remembering things and being able to recall names and all that kind of stuff has to do with connections between the various nodes in the brain. And the teenage years are critical in this. Connections are reinforced, but they also die off. This is where that phrase, use it or lose it, comes. If teenagers use their brain heavily, those connections will become strong and they will never really die off. If they fail to use it, those connections will actually die off and it will be much harder in the future for them to, uh, to regain those connections. So this process is called synaptogenesis and it's still going on into your late teens. In fact, it goes on until you're about 28. And some of the women in this room would say their husbands are still undergoing synaptogenesis because they still behave like teenagers. It goes on for an incredibly long time. So you can see on this diagram um, the grey matter dying off and the brain becoming more and more solidified in its connections as we move into our late 20s. And things are then become settled, which is why, of course, it becomes harder and harder to learn new things as you get older because your synapses are kind of set in stone, if you like. So, what's different about the teenage brain? Really important quote here, the teenage brain is not just an adult brain with fewer miles on it. It's really easy for us as teachers to think that. We've got these big lads and girls in our classes. They kind of look like adults. 
they're not adults. Even if they're physically mature, they are definitely not adults. And what happens in the teenage brain is that most of this back part of the brain is effectively adult. So the stuff that gives you control of your uh, arms and legs, all that kind of stuff, by the time you're a teenager is settled. But this frontal area here, the frontal lobe, responsible for things like problem solving, concentrating and thinking, behavior, personality, mood, assessment of risk is not firmed up yet. So that area of the brain is still being de developed. And this is where teenagers get their kind of the stereotype teenager. I put that um, yogurt pot to illustrate a point. When I was a housemaster at Uppingham, one of the times that I've got really angry as a teacher, I still remember it now, was when a guy in a newly painted corridor with lovely new curtains decided it would be fun to drop kick a yogurt pot down the corridor. And the yogurt went everywhere. And I'm going, what on God's earth made you drop that yogurt pot? But of course, that's the way his brain works. The teenage brain is not, doesn't yet associate risk, stupidity with its fully functioning motor, motor functions. So this is why in teenagers you get that kind of hideous, risk-taking, really bizarre behavior occasionally because they're running a fully powered car, if you like, with no control. Yeah? And th that explains why that guy decided it would be a good idea to drop a yogurt pot down the corridor. He wasn't thinking. Yeah? He wasn't thinking. In fact, he probably wanted a reaction because um, if we look at the kind of evolutionary basis of the brain, what's going on in the teenage years is you're finding out for the first time for yourself what is dangerous and good and what is a bad idea. So you actually want a reaction. And this is why teenagers often get into arguments with their parents and do things deliberately to annoy their parents because they're trying to push those boundaries and they want kickback. Feedback is the thing. That's what they want. That feedback helps that process of maturation of the frontal cortex. So they're pushing, they're pushing, they're being annoying. To us as adults, we find some of their behavior totally bizarre, but there are important evolutionary reasons for that. They are trying to firm up what's a good idea and what's a bad idea by testing all the time, yeah? Rather like toddlers do, but these people now have adult bod bodies, so it's, it's even more destructive. And of course, they're getting ready to leave the nest. So another thing about the teenage uh, psyche is that whereas when you're age 10, the center of your universe is your parents and perhaps your brothers and sisters, and you feel terribly secure and pleasant and the world is clearly bounded, as you move into the teenage years, what your peers say makes much more of a difference. So at 10, if you fall out with a friend, you can always run back to mummy and daddy. If it happens at 15, it's a bigger deal. Yeah? I remember uh, with my own daughter, um, when something was posted on Facebook uh, about her one time. And to me, it was just not a big deal. I couldn't understand why she was making such a big fuss about it. It's because her center of security had moved from the family to being bolstered by her peers. So if her peers were saying things or not saying things about her on Facebook, it really mattered to her. It really mattered to her. So that's what's happening. I hope if any of your children do anything stupid like drop kick a yogurt pot down a corridor, you might think before you go off the handle like I did, why have they done that? Because they're testing boundaries. It does help just to contextualize it a bit. That's what they're doing. Summary, teenagers are naturally impulsive. Nature actually intends it that way. That is the way they are supposed to be. Teenagers' physical ability outstrips their ability to assess risk, to plan and exercise self-control. Teenagers increasingly indulge in peer-directed behaviors, so they mind less what you think and they mind more what their friends think. And teenagers are attracted to risk and to novelty by the need for feedback. And this is the key, positive or negative. So they'll do things they know are gonna tip you over the edge, and they'll do things that they know you're gonna love. And there'll be no rhyme or reason as to why they're doing that, because feedback is the thing. That's what they want. They want feedback to start firming up that frontal cortex. So, as a result of that, we shouldn't be surprised by any of these things. The idea of cognitive overload, which I'm going to touch on in a second. 
by things like bullying and sexting, which are teenage problems these days, by anxiety, by gullibility in terms of phishing. So phishing is when someone sends you an email and says, please give me your bank account details and your name. Because teenagers don't have a good risk assessment part of their brain, they're much more likely to go, oh, okay then, and type in their details. And you're thinking, what? Why have you done that? Yeah, why have you done that? It's because they don't have that ability to assess risk. Grooming. I often think, you know, what idiot would make friends with a 35-year-old man on Facebook? And of course, it's people who cannot assess risk, think they know it all, when in fact they don't. Teenagers, yeah. Eating disorders, stress, sleeplessness, self-harm. It all sounds quite negative, but put in the context of why it's happening, it gives us a frame of reference, at least, to understand what's going on. So, a few simple steps, things that I think um, we could do as teachers and you could do as parents to help them through these difficult uh, stages of life. The first is that we, and this includes adults actually, we touch our phones, and this is an average figure which I find extraordinary, 2,617 times a day, says one study. You'll find other, other uh, studies that say different figures. The point is, whatever the figure is, it's way too much, it's totally unhealthy. Just look at these two uh, figures from a study that was done on a 25-year-old and a 45-year-old. This draws attention to the fact, by the way, that we're just as guilty, if not more so, than our teenagers. These are the number of phone sessions over a 24 period, starting from 12 a.m. going to the next 12 a.m. slot. And this particular woman is on her phone pretty much all the time, except for a short period when she sleeps. Now for the teenage brain, which can't assess risk and which needs those otherworldly experience, real life experiences to help that front part of the brain firm up, this is really bad news. Because if they're looking at their phone, they're not getting the stimulation that they would have got when we were all hunter-gatherers. And remember that our brains are identical in every respect to cavemen. There hasn't been long enough for us to evolve into digital natives, which is a term I sometimes hear. There is nothing different about your child's brain to your great, 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 great grandfather's brain. They're exactly the same. So don't think, oh, it's okay now because they're digital natives. In no way are they different from your ancestors. Their brains have not had long enough to adapt to this in any positive way. They're just the same as you or I. This is not healthy. Um, one thing that I definitely think we can do, we ourselves and our children, is stop our children taking their phones into their bedrooms. Yeah? You shouldn't do it either. I find myself doing this, and I'm actually quite horrified by my behaviour. I get up in the morning, the first thing I do is go to the loo with my mobile phone. Immediately, I'm doing someone else's business. What a total waste of time. That's my time to plan my day and get on with my routine. The moment I look at my email, Mr. Farley has given me jobs. Yeah. <laughs> so, bear with me on this, guys. They're not going to like it, but they should not be taking their phone into their bedroom. They will say things like, oh, I need it to wake up. Get one of these. Yeah, get one of these. They don't need it. It's extremely unhealthy to take your mobile phone into your bedroom, and we shouldn't be doing it. We should be stopping them doing that. Um, the second thing is, uh, they're getting a huge number of influences from outside, way more than we ever did when we were at school, and sometimes that's a good thing. They have a, this enormous amount of information at their fingertips, but they need to be grounded in the family. Yeah? And this applies for boarders and for day pupils. There needs to be a time when they sit down and talk to you as human beings. So however busy you are, however important your job is, you should make time, perhaps once a week, to sit down as a family without devices and talk to your children. It's so, so important. That will help them put these things in place, all these influences they need some kind of context which you as parents can give them. I really think that's important that you sit down and chat to your children. In the boarding houses, we have made uh, one evening a week as a no device evening. That's right, isn't it, Mr. McDonald? Two. Two evenings a week now. 
and uh, we say strictly, you may not get your phone out at mealtimes. We want you talking to other human beings. I think that really helps. Remember, we're, all of this is helping that frontal cortex firm up. Yeah. Um, Next is the issue of cognitive overload. So cognitive overload is the idea that you can really only do one job at a time. It doesn't matter whether you're male or female, by the way, you can really only do one job at a time. If I had been blaring music into Mr. Farley's ear and asking him to do arithmetic at the same time he was trying to do that task, he wouldn't have even been able to remember one number. Yeah? And yet I see all the time teenagers trying to work with music. You cannot do it. All the studies show that it does not work. There is no such thing as multitasking. This is from this lady who's from Harvard, I think. Um, if you're doing a repetitive task requiring not much focus or cognitive processing, you can listen to upbeat music. So if they say they're doing that, that's not homework. That's the most routine, pathetic, undemanding task ever, and it's not going to make them better or cleverer. So they shouldn't be set that sort of task for homework. That's like copying letters onto a page. Um, look at this. For doing the kind of work that your kids should be doing, problem solving, highly cognitive, complex tasks that are really quite difficult and hurt, and they don't like doing, but are the only tasks that are going to make them better and gain mastery, they should not be listening to any music. Only in the breaks. Yeah. So at my last school, we banned music completely from the classroom. It's quite common in maths classrooms to see kids listening to music while doing maths problems. That's wrong. There should be total silence in the classroom while they're doing that, and they should be focusing on the task. And at home, if you can help with that, so much the better. Explain the science behind it, and it makes it easier for them to swallow the pill. Because they don't like it, and they think they know better. But the brain does not work like that. The brain does not work like that. Um, number three, uh, number four, sorry, is this age-old problem about whether it's cool to read stuff on a screen or on paper. Now, I love computers. I love my smartphone. I love my Kindle. I do a lot of stuff online. But for really, really hard cognitive tasks, the research shows that paper is the best thing to work on. Um, and it's because... Reading and writing is a totally unnatural task for us humans. It's come to civilization quite late. And remember, there's no difference between our brains and those of cavemen who could neither read or write. So we don't, uh, we don't have a, a proper cognitive hook, if you like, for words. Yeah? We actually view them in our minds as things. Twigs, hammers, axes. Words are things. Yeah? So when you remember them, you remember them as being located somewhere in space. Now on a Kindle, that location changes all the time. You can't find it in the same place. Sometimes the word will appear at the bottom of the page, sometimes at the top of the page, and so on. I know there are sophisticated search mechanisms in a Kindle, but in order to make something really stick in your mind, you need to remember physically where you saw it. Yeah? And this will probably ring bells. If you've been reading a physical book and you think, oh, that passage was really interesting, you can somehow remember whether it was on the left or the right page or which part of the book. In a Kindle, you can't do that. Yeah? You can either use the search functionality or you just can't find it. Yeah? So um, I'm not saying, please don't get me wrong, I'm not saying throw away your smartphone, throw away your Kindle. I think used for reading, they are great. But if you want to really, really learn something, there's no substitute for actually getting um, paper. That's writing it down on paper or reading it in a physical book, which is why I'm so delighted that in this school we have a physical library with physical books where that kind of uh, thing is embraced. Or I'm sad to say that at my last school we ditched our library, which I think was a bit of a mistake. Um, and this idea on the, on the right, which I've spoken about, the idea that there are digital natives. There are no such thing as digital natives. There is nothing different about your children and their brains to your brains. Yeah? And they're exactly the same as they are to your great-great-grandparents. So, I'm going to wrap up because I'm running out of time. Um, I hope this isn't all bad news and negative. 
as Mr. Farley said at the beginning, I'm hugely enthusiastic about technology and its ability to do fantastic things for us and our children. You sometimes see people saying, oh, the kids today, it's not like it was before. Look at this quote from Socrates, 469 BC. Our youth now love luxury. These are people who were long dead before your great, 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 great grandfather. And he was saying they were softies. Yeah. They have bad manners. Contempt for authority. This is way before, the, way before Christ. Children are now tyrants, not the servants of their households. Does this sound familiar? <laughs> um, they no longer rise when their elders enter the room. They contradict their parents, chatter before company, gobble up the dainties at the table, cross their legs and tyrannize their teachers. I'm not quite sure what was wrong back in the day about crossing your legs. But you get the point. Um, there's nothing new under the sun. And our kids are definitely no worse than we, are, we were or your grandparents were or their grandparents were. They're just the same. Um, but we've got the benefit of hindsight and we could help them a bit. Thank you. So, any questions, which I'll try to answer. That either means you've all fallen asleep or I answered everything. <laughs> yeah. Actually, you raised uh, yeah. the issue about mobile phones. Uh, teenagers, of course, but um, study. I guess you looked at a lot of research at this point. What is the appropriate age before they should have a mobile phone? Well, um, I think there are... They can start quite young on a brick, I would say. Um, they are just useful. It's incredibly useful to be able to ring uh, your eight-year-old and say, I'm just coming to pick you up. But give them a brick initially, because there's much less you can do with it. I, I do happen to think that by the time they start secondary school, so between 11 and 13, giving them a smartphone is the way forward. I know they're quite expensive, but they're going to enter a world where their whole lives are organized on smartphones. So the earlier we can get them planning on their smartphone, responding to emails on their smartphone, and so on, the better. Providing, and there's a big caveat here, providing we are monitoring their use. We are monitoring their use. I think that's really important. We need to get them used to doing the kinds of things that I described. I'm charging my phone downstairs because I'm going to sleep now. That kind of thing. Yeah. It shouldn't become a tyranny for them which it can so easily become. Does that...? Yes. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, in terms of mobile phone is one thing. Another thing is something that we, ourselves, we have just been learning the last five to ten years. Uh, social media and other things. Uh, how control, monitoring, I don't know what word to put here. But, uh, yeah, so the social media companies do have restrictions. It's, it's quite sad, actually, how much this is ignored, but Facebook is 13, and Twitter, I wouldn't let them on Twitter until they're 18, to be honest, because it's entirely open for them. They can, it's far, it's like, you wouldn't let your child into the centre of Bangkok and say, see you later, would you? Until they were 18, at least. And yet that's effectively what you're doing on platforms like Twitter, because they're so open. The thing about Facebook is it can be controlled. I'd educate yourselves about the, the, the restrictions and make sure your child knows. You know, if you post that, who's it actually going to? They're incredibly difficult and they keep changing, which is annoying. So if I ever make a presentation showing parents how to manage Facebook settings, they've changed it by the time the presentation has come around, which is annoying. So there's no really other way around other than going into the settings, which are buried in Facebook, and appraising yourself of the latest updates to how things work. They've got a bit better, better than they were in the early days, of warning you, do you really want to post that to everyone in the world? Yeah. And um, there's loads we can do as a school, and we do do, about informing them about that whole idea of your digital footprint. Yeah. Uh, pretty much anything you put on the internet, even if you then take it down, is potentially there forever. Because once it's on the internet, someone can copy it. So you can say, oh, I'll take it down now, it doesn't matter, someone can have copied it. Uh, so you've got to make them aware of that. It, it really is a permanent thing. When you go on the internet, your footprint is in concrete. Uh, and you can't really get rid of it, whatever happens. Uh, you can't guarantee that you've got rid of it anyway. Anna. Yeah. Is there a minimum amount of hours or a maximum amount of hours that a child so we introduce iPads from year five, don't we? Like they, they get iPads. Yeah. yeah. Um, is there a 
a maximum amount of hours that child should be expected not to exceed on a device because they're using it in class and I assume the homework is probably centred around needing to use that. Yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting point that. If we were talking about a book and they were using a book in class and then they were coming home and using a book, we wouldn't have second thoughts about saying, well, yeah, that's okay. And I think iPads in class are much the same as books, albeit that I've said they're, they're maybe not quite as effective if you're trying to learn stuff. So I don't think, if you're what you're driving at, should you be worried that they're exposed to all this technology at home and then they're using it, uh, sorry, at school and then they're using it at home? I don't think you should be too worried about that. I do think you should be worried if it's affecting their social life at home, if it's affecting their sleep at home, if it's stopping you sitting down as a family and conversing with them, it's then an issue. Yeah? But um, you need to steer away from the idea that, oh, you've been on a computer all the time in school, therefore you can't use it at home. I don't think it quite works like that. You assume, and I hope you're right in this school, that if they've been using it at school, they've been using it constructively, and it's great, it's a good thing. So there's no need, therefore, to restrict them in the evening. The issue about your eyes and so on, um, screens these days are much, much more friendly on your eyes. And it's, very di it's not really different to reading a book. So there, there is no issue in that sense. You can set your mobile phone, if you're interested, to blue light automatically after a certain, uh, after a certain time of, in the evening, which kind of calms you down. Yeah. But if you tell them that, they'll then think, oh, well, I've got the blue light setting, so I can use it in bed. No, you need to have it downstairs. Yeah. Um, the blue light setting doesn't get over the problem that you shouldn't really be looking at your phone. I don't think you should take your phone into your bedroom. Yeah. I really don't. Nothing new. I mean, we've had yeah. televisions around since. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And the danger was exactly the same coming home and sitting in front of something that's pretty at you with a screen and having screens in the bedroom. Yeah. Well. I do think, I actually think that the internet is not as bad as TV because it's more active. TV is entirely passive. You sit there and do nothing and are entertained. But computers require you to get involved. So, it, to my mind, they are not as bad in that sense. The same restrictions don't quite apply. It, it just comes down to that assessment of, of you as an adult. Is it affecting their social life? Is it becoming unhealthy? Is it stopping them sleeping? Any of those things, you need to step in, uh, and quite firmly. And I think if you, if you mention some of this science, it somehow lessens the blow, because you are, they aren't going to like it. But if you just say, the science shows, they're, mu they're actually more likely to accept it. Teenagers are rational beings. And I found that if, if you use that line, the science shows, you won't get into these big blow ups. Oh, every other parent lets, me, let, lets them take their iPad to bed. Yeah. By the way, we could all agree now that none of us are going to let our, our kids take their devices to bed. And then you can say, no, they don't. <laughs> no, they don't. They've all been instructed not to. Please spread the word. I, I think that is a very important message. Yeah. Read a book in bed, but don't take your device. Um, what is the minimum age for a parent to give the personal mobile phone to kids? In your opinion? Well, uh, like a, a brick. Yeah. I think a brick. <laughs> to the point where the age we think they're not going to lose it, you know. Because yeah. it's only for phoning you. I think they are great. Why would you not? Yeah. Yeah, if it's going to be so useful to them. Yeah. Oh, right, okay, so, pro so secondary school, I would say, when they've, when they've entered secondary school, they're entering the world where they have a legitimate need for a mobile phone. But think about the time when your parents first gave you a watch and a diary. Yeah, you were, what, what age were you then? Yeah. I think I got a watch at about age nine, and I started using a diary properly at probably about 12, so round about that age, about the point they become teenagers, they're okay to use these devices. Yeah. Um, yeah. Any questions? Mr. Farley, I, we've got to wrap up, but I don't know whether you just want to quickly talk about... So, sorry, yeah. It's, um, maybe not related to you, but you said, like, you know, they need the feedback from us, like, you know, they try to do the crazy thing. Any advice? Or we just, when they do the crazy thing as a teenager... Oh, right, when they, go, when they get angry with you. No, I mean, like, they do the crazy thing, they try to test. 
So how, what is the FY you... What, you mean like kicking a yoghurt yeah. pot? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is so difficult when that happens because you will be incandescent. So the, uh, what I always say, and I'm not sure I followed my own advice in that situation, but I, what I would always say is, you are the adult. You are the adult. They're a child or a teenager. They're out of control. The adult thing to do in that situation is to remain entirely composed, to recognize where the root of that behavior, and to be the calm adult influence there. If you yourself start behaving like a teenager, you're an idiot, yeah, then it's going to go nowhere. It's really going to go nowhere. So be the adult. Be the adult. It's what we're told in teacher training, and it's so important for parenting as well. Sometimes kids will do nutty things, and what they want is someone calm, sensible, bring the tempo down, don't worry, that's how it's going to work. Yeah? But it's, easy said, it's easier said than done, because when someone kicks a yogurt pot over your lovely new painted corridor and all down your curtains, you're going to be really angry, you are. You've just got to try and, uh, and hold your... So what, what I thought I'd just very quickly do, because we've got to go in a second and you have as well. Mr Farley, uh, what are the rules in school for, say, a 15-year-old using their phone? This is just, uh, I'm playing devil's advocate here. Outside of the classroom. Yeah, outside of the classroom. Um, go to the E-zone. So, yeah, so we have these E-zones. They're not allowed to wander around anywhere. I'm sorry, I'm talking for you here, but uh, not allowed to wander around anywhere. They must be in a specific place. So it needs to be a conscious act. We saw by those people using it too much that it's not a conscious act, it's a twitch. It's a twitch, they keep getting it out. It must be a conscious act. There's some good yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. background actually to the development of the E zone policy and <laughs> the E zone location that some of the, you may not be aware of as parents. So, dots around the campus are E zones uh, where a child can go beginning of the day, break time, end of the day to use a device. Um, and we had some lovely feedback um, a few months ago where we had some visiting uh, education on campus who could not understand how we managed to achieve this situation where our students, your, your children, weren't walking around the campus looking at their devices and actually are looking up and, you know, as you know here at Harrow, we like to look each other in the eye and say hello, good morning, good afternoon, how are you? Um, and the reason is the ease and policy, but further to that, the fact that the policy was actually developed by the students, so our senior students engaged our um, prep and uh, SRFI students with this issue. We've got this problem, we don't want to be walking around the campus looking at our devices, we all agree that's not a good thing, so what are we going to do with it? And the conversation led to, okay, for um, in restricted areas at certain times of the day, we should be able to use devices, so let's agree where those areas are, let's agree what those times are, and that's what led to our e-zone policy. But it didn't come from us, it actually came from the students. And that really empowers now senior students to, to engage with uh, um, less senior students and say, no, come on, this, this is not okay, there's places for that, there's time for that. It's much more powerful than being imposed by the senior masters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for coming. Thank you very much. Um, I want to just, you. sorry, before um, a, a very well deserved round of applause, thank you. Um, Tim, in that, I felt that that was a very appropriate introduction by you, of yourself, to our community, um, covering a wide range of themes, chiefly around technology and the teenage brain, but also very mindful of, of um, our students, your children and their welfare, um, very tech savvy, very aware of how it is to be a parent as well as a teacher, um, uh, the quality of boarding as well as day student provision in here at the school. So a very broad-reaching introduction to our community, reflecting your broad-reaching role within this community. So thank you very much for that, Tim. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming.